morning. The reading today is Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 31. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparation for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the cock crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. 
and all the others said the same. Well, thank you, Trues, so much for reading our Bible passage. Please do keep your Bibles open at Mark chapter 14 as we look at God's word together this morning. Mark is now sharply focusing his attention upon the last few days of Jesus' life before his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. The first half of Mark chapter 14 that we're going to be looking at this morning records three events, three events that will help us to remember that there is an action to remember, there is a saviour to remember and an instruction to remember. Now, I wonder how you get on with remembering. Perhaps like many of us, you have to write things down on lists, lots of lists everywhere. If only you could remember where you left the list. Someone told me recently they were searching for an important document in their home and they couldn't find it anywhere. They turned the whole house upside down looking for it and frustratedly they said, right, I can't find it. I'll have to write it out again. They started to write out this important document but couldn't remember every detail. But once they'd written it out to the best they could, they were determined not to lose it. And, and then they remembered, I, I've got a file in my desk marked important documents. I'll store it away there. It's the kind of place where they've got their birth certificate and passport and important things like that. And yes, you've guessed it. As they took this important document into the important documents folder, what did they find? The very thing they'd been looking for stored away. Well, how do you get on with remembering? We often forget things, don't we? Uh, sometimes we're just absent minded, but other times we just don't think about the things that we already know. We just don't recall them back to mind. The first half of Mark chapter 14 records three events that will not only teach us about Jesus' death and resurrection, but they'll also help us to remember. They're going to help us to remember actions that we can do. They're going to, to help us to remember a saviour who we can love. And they're going to help us uh, to remember an instruction that we can believe and hold on to. So this morning, as we consider Jesus preparing for his death on the cross, we'll witness these three, three things. We'll witness this woman acting in wholehearted devotion to Jesus. We'll witness Jesus himself sharing a familiar meal, but giving it a new meaning. And we'll witness the disciples confused, but getting a message of hope. And throughout it all, we're going to see Jesus, who knows what is going to happen to him. There may well be a plot against him to kill him, but Jesus is in sovereign control and willingly goes to the cross. So let's have a look, first of all, then, at an action to remember in verses 1 to 11. The first 11 verses of Mark chapter 14 are all centred around this action of an unnamed woman, but are bracketed by the sinful actions at the beginning of the religious leaders and at the end by Judas. Just look at verses 1 and 2 and verses 10 and 11 with me. Now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. And then verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So we watched for an opportunity to hand him over. You see, we see the wicked and sinful actions of the religious leaders and of Judas at the beginning and the end. They've wanted for a long time to arrest Jesus and kill Jesus. And Judas provides them with that opportunity as they he betrays Jesus for some money. But the religious leaders and Judas are really the sideshow to what's really going on, because in contrast to both of them is this woman in Simon's house who lovingly acts towards Jesus. Now, if you've been following our Lent readings in John's Gospel, then yesterday you'll have read that John identifies this woman as Mary. For Mark, who it is pales into the background in comparison with what she does. Just listen again to what she does in verse 3. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. 
Now, to you and me, that might seem a very strange thing to do, to show your love and devotion to someone. We don't go around, do we, pouring oil on somebody else or giving them a can of deodorant to show our love for them. And the people who are in the room, well, they're mostly concerned with what they see as the seeming waste, the cost of it all. It's, it's worth a year's wages. And perhaps for a moment, with all of that unnecessary criticism, she might have thought, have I done something wrong? But Jesus speaks words of comfort. Jesus sees the love with which she has acted. And listen to what Jesus says about her action in verses six to eight. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them any time you want, but you'll not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Do you hear those three things Jesus says about her loving actions? The first thing he says is she's done a beautiful thing to me. Her actions are expressing her devotion, her love for Jesus. And this woman has decided she wants to worship Jesus. She wants to show him her love by doing something costly for him. And Jesus says she's done a beautiful thing. The second thing he says about her action is that she's done what she could. She's not done what someone else should have done. She's not done something with somebody else's property. No, her action comes from what she's able to do. She gives what she has. And the third thing Jesus says about her actions is that she's poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. So she's anointed his body for burial. That should have really got the room thinking and talking about not only her actions, but what Jesus was saying. She's done this ahead of time. Jesus is going to die. Now, he doesn't imply that she's got any foreknowledge of his coming fate. Maybe she had. Maybe she had heard and understood when Jesus had taught that he must suffer and die and rise again. But Jesus doesn't imply that she's got any foreknowledge. No, he sees that she's simply acted out of spontaneity, out of generosity, out of the fullness of her heart in her love for Jesus. She's acted. Now, of course, her actions are before Jesus' death and resurrection. Our actions are after the event. But as we remember what she did and how she showed her love for Jesus, then how much more should we show the love for the one who we know has died and risen again and is one day coming back? How much more then should we be generous with our money or with our time, with our lives to show our love for Jesus? As we see her action, we should be spurred into action. How much more can we do with what we can, with what we've been given? Now, that might not be what someone else is able to do, but how much more can we do with what we can for Jesus, our Lord? Perhaps as we read this story, it even challenges us to not be too quick to criticise. Now, of course, one other big difference that Jesus acknowledges here and that we can see is that we don't have Jesus physically with us to serve. But we do have one another. We do have the church, the body of Christ. And we're called to do good to all people, but especially the household of faith, the family of believers. And of course, we have those who are poor, those who are in need. And as Jesus expresses, giving to the poor is a good way of showing our love for Jesus. This is an action to remember. And also through telling her story, of course, Mark is getting you and I to, to ponder, to think through, to really consider where we stand. You see, as he tells this story, there's no middle ground. Whose side are you on? Mark is challenging us as he recalls this story. Are you with the religious leaders and Judas or are you with this woman? You see, we're either for Jesus or we're against Jesus. And if we're for Jesus, then that means being totally devoted to him. It's an action to remember. Well, after that, in verses 12 through to 26, we've got a saviour to remember. What happens next on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is very familiar to us as Christians. Jesus shares a Passover meal with his disciples who ask him a question in verse 12. 
On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Now, we love sharing meals together, don't we? We mark important moments by sharing significant meals together. It's one of the many things we've missed in the last 12 months. Today is Mother's Day, which of course worryingly means that I will be cooking. So when you see smoke signals rising from Sharnbrook, don't be alarmed, it's only me at work. But we love to do it on days like today, or on birthdays or anniversaries or at weddings, times when we gather families and friends together for a meal. And the meal is, well, it's so much more than just eating food, isn't it? If we were just going to feed our bodies, well, we could do that with a bowl of cornflakes. Now, the meal says something. It does something. A shared meal together shares our, our time, our lives together. And this Passover meal, this Passover festival was the most important of meals for God's people, as it retold the story of how God had rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. As they ate the meal, they remembered, they recalled the stories of that rescue. God sent a series of plagues upon the people of Egypt to persuade Pharaoh to let my people go. And before the final plague, the Lord instructed his people to sacrifice a lamb and to put the blood on the top of the door and on the doorposts uh, so that the angel of the Lord would pass over. We read in Exodus 12 these words, when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. So this meal is such an important meal and as host, the responsibility falls to Jesus to break the bread and to take the cup, giving thanks to God for rescuing his people and providing for all of their needs. But as we read through Mark's account, we see this is no ordinary Passover meal, for Jesus makes an astonishing statement. This is a familiar meal for them, but now Jesus turns it upside down and makes this statement in verse 22. While they were eating... Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. You see, with these words, Jesus inaugurates something new. This meal is the start of a new covenant, a commitment from God to his people. And it points to Jesus' sacrifice, his sin offering. They'll no longer need to look back to the Exodus, but they'll look to Jesus, who is the Messiah, the Christ, who's come to bring this final rescue. Now, the Passover meal did just that. It, it looked back to that rescue of God's people from Egypt, but it also looked forward to a day when God would bring about his final rescue through the Messiah. As Jesus breaks the bread and shares the cup, he's saying, look, this day is here. It is now. It is today. There is a new covenant. See, Jesus says we're to look to him for rescue through his sacrificial death on the cross. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Paul writes that to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, that Christ is our Passover lamb whose death will rescue all who believe in him by faith. And just as the, the lamb was killed and the blood was put on the doorposts so that the Lord passed over those houses, so God's wrath, his righteous judgment for our sin, will pass over us because it is Jesus, the Passover lamb, who bears that wrath through his death. Jesus is starting something new, so we've got a saviour to remember. But before we move on, just notice three little details that Mark includes. The first is that Jesus has sovereign knowledge. In a similar way to Mark 11 and the Palm Sunday account, when Jesus told his disciples to go and get a donkey for him to ride into Jerusalem on and told them all of the details. So now he sends out his disciples into Jerusalem with very clear instructions what they're to do and what they're to say. And then just look at verse 16. 
Verse 16 records the disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Everything happens exactly as Jesus describes. You see, Jesus is going to the cross purposefully and in control. These are not random events, but events sovereignly determined by God. Jesus is willingly and purposefully going to lay down his life for you and for me. Jesus has sovereign knowledge. The second little detail that Mark includes is in verse 18, and it's Jesus reclining at the table. Uh, Verse 17, when evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. But it's that that little visual image Mark gives us of them reclining at the table. Now, that's in complete contrast to the Passover meal. The Passover meal was eaten in haste. The people of in in the days of, of Egypt and the Exodus were to wear their cloaks tucked into their belts with their sandals on their feet and their staff in their hand. They were to eat in haste, ready to go. But now they're free. God had liberated them. And these free men don't just sit, they recline and retell the story in peace. It's a lovely picture as Jesus reclines at the table. Jesus has come to bring us total peace with God forever. As we put our trust in Jesus, we're not sitting on the edge of our seats having to to worry or wonder what's going to happen next. But a a, a picture of peace, of relaxing around the table together. Jesus reclines at the table. But the third little detail Mark includes is that Jesus uses the bread, not the lamb, as an illustration. You see, Jesus doesn't use the Passover lamb to illustrate his point, but the bread, and it's unleavened bread, we're told, bread made without yeast, again, recalling the speed of which they had to depart from Egypt. Now, Jesus has been called both the the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and also the bread of life. And as he shares this Passover meal with his disciples, he's trying to teach them the meaning of his death on the cross. He's been trying to tell them for quite a while that he must suffer and die and rise again. But as he takes this bread, he's telling them and showing them that his body will be broken and they can receive by faith the forgiveness of their sins as they share in that bread, as they receive Jesus by faith. It also gives you and I something to make our own to be used as a a means of grace, to not only remember Jesus our Saviour, but also to draw strength. So when we share communion together, when we share the bread and the wine, we remember Christ's death on the cross, but we take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for us. And we feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. So there's an action to remember. There's a saviour to remember. And the third event Mark records is an instruction to remember. Jesus instructs his disciples that they will all fall away and scatter as he goes to his death. Just look at verse 27. You'll all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now, in those words, uh, an Old Testament prophecy from Zechariah 13 is fulfilled. Peter claims even if others fall away, he never will. But Jesus knows and Jesus predicts that Peter will actually disown him three times. But in this last section, perhaps the key verse isn't verse 27. Verse 27, I think, is there to be contrasted to verse 18. Verse 18 is one of you will betray me. Verse 27 is all of you will fall away. So there's the shock of we can't believe that one of us is going to betray you. Not I, not I, they all say. And then there's the sadness of verse 27 of you will all, you'll all walk away. And Peter says, I won't. But perhaps the key verse really there is not verse 27, but verse 28. Just look at that with me. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Jesus tells them really clearly and really plainly, I will rise and we will meet. But it's almost lost in the noise, isn't it, of you'll all fall away. And Peter's saying, I'll never fall away. And Jesus is predicting that he he will deny him three times. In fact, these are some words that they'll have to be reminded of after the resurrection. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 7, we're told um, when Jesus is seen risen from the dead. But go, tell the disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. 
there you will see him just as he told you. And here are the very words in verse 28. After I've risen, I'll go ahead of you into Galilee. Yes, there will be betrayal. There will be desertion, but far greater. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is grace. There is forgiveness. There is reconciliation. Here's an instruction to remember. There is hope and a future for us because Jesus will rise from the dead and we'll see him again. For the disciples, they would see him very soon, a few days after. One day we will see him in all his glory. So here's the first half of Mark chapter 14, recording three events for us to help us remember. We're to remember actions, actions that we can do in wholehearted devotion to Jesus. We need to think about that this morning, don't we? To not let that just be whipped away from us as we come to a close this morning, but to think through, what can I do this week? What action can I take as I remember that action so lovingly given to Jesus? What action can I do to show my wholehearted devotion to Jesus? Then there's a saviour to remember, a saviour who loved us and laid down his life for us. How can we show our love, our worship of Jesus who first loved us? Again, perhaps today you want to take the time to, to praise him, to thank him, to pray to him, to sing a song of praise, to express not only your remembrance of Christ's death, but your worship and love for him. And then there's an instruction to remember, something that we can believe and hold on to today as a message of hope. Jesus has risen from the dead. That means there is grace and forgiveness for us reconciliation with him. He is alive forevermore. Well, perhaps as we draw some of these strands together, we can sing together a song of praise to give him glory. Let's sing together, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness.
Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Special thanks to Samantha and to Bernard and Trues for all of your help this morning. Also to Will and to Sean for all of your help as well. If you're able to join with us in 15 minutes time for coffee over Zoom, please do so. As we close our service, let us think about one another and let's say the words of the grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen.